thank you very much for inviting me to this series. Um, this is the first time I am here, but I enjoyed it last time, so <laughs> very happy to return um, to speech to speak about the subject in a series that I don't always feel so comfortable. And that you, you will be all right. Patrick, that's the truth. You belong to me. Oh, okay, thank you very <laughs> much. But if I say I'm not always feel so comfortable, it's because I'm a historian. And I'm a historian of global history, historian of European history, but especially historian of the long term. But historians have not, uh, usually do not speak about the present, and certainly not from a perspective of drawing conclusions or uh, making things really relevant. Um, actually, for a number of reasons, historians refrain for that. If people speak about what we can learn about his from history, it's always non-historians who say that. You will very rarely hear something like that from a historian. Actually, I'm very, I'm, I am one of those few who think history should be relevant. And the book I wrote is partly written uh, from that perspective, but nevertheless, I am first of all a historian who looks at the past because of the past, not, uh, and that's from the perspective of uh, social and political science, not to explain the present, but if you can explain the present, that's very nice if you can do that also, but it's not the prime objective. Um, the book, my talk today is inspired by the, uh, the book I wrote in 2015, but it's just published in paperback, so <laughs> I don't think it's still highly relevant. Um, in contrast to what the title as such might uh, suggest, the book is not really about European integration history, not even in the broad perspective. It is really an essay on <laughs> European political and cultural history in the long term. And I use the history of Euro European plans, ideas about European unity as a sort of canvas. It's actually a way to tell another story. So there are more than one stories in, uh, in the book. Actually, there are quite several ones if you're going to look in detail. I do want to react with the book against the traditional narratives of Europe, the narratives in which the European Union is the pinnacle, the conclusion of either a history after the Second World War or even a very long time history of imagining unity uh, and European values originating somewhere in antiquity or whatever. That's a kind of history that I really want to react against. And I do so in part from that global, in part post-colonial history, because that's actually the biggest part of my teaching at the university is about global uh, and post-colonial history. And that gives you, I hope, a different perspective also on European history. By first, I started to think about what is Europe. Now you can approach the subject from very different ways, but if my book was on imagining European unity, <laughs> If you think about European unity, you have to speak about you know, what are you going to unify? You need a concept of Europe. I started by looking from when are people speaking about Europe in a meaningful way. That's what I call a subjective perspective. The objective perspective, perspective would be you have a definition of Europe, and then you go to look from there. I take the subjective position, what is understood by Europe, and then move up. That is what I did, and then I immediately came with the conclusion that uh, speaking about Europe in a meaningful way is well, the first instances date from somewhere in the 8th century, and you have a number of examples from the 8th until more or less the 11th century and then forward, but always more or less equal with Christendom. And Christendom, beware, means two things. It refers to the religion, Christianity, 
but it refers also to a political significance. It refers to a political system in which Christianity is state religion, basically. You can say a lot of things, other things, but that is the, the basic definition. So if that is the case, and there is not, not much discussion about it, we speak 8th, 11th century, so not earlier. Part of the book I react against those who imagine a direct link between Europe and antiquity. I'm not going to go into details now. If people ask about that, I will do that later, but I will not do that. Uh, that's, that's one element. A second element is Obviously, if we speak about Europe, European unity today, we don't refer to the concept of Christendom anymore. So there has been a dissociation. That dissociation is a very complex and long-term history. It happened in the course, let's say, mainly of the 16th, 17th, 18th century. By then, the concept of Europe means something else than Christendom. Important element, and I'll return to this. A last element is we are used to think in terms of secularization. There are a few words that make me highly irritated, and one of those is secularization. Because it's so widely interpreted in so many wrong ways. I'm not going into the details on what it means and what it doesn't mean. Now and then I will refer to it. But one thing I emphasize throughout the book is that even if Christendom as such doesn't exist anymore, and you could refer to the French Revolution, separation of church and state, but even that is horrible, Christianity remains an important political factor, I would say until today, but certainly until the 1950s. Without any doubt. Um, the whole idea that you find in, in political history that early modern times everything is religious and then suddenly around the French Revolution <laughs> political history becomes secular is nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Okay. But if ideas about European unity, of Europe and European unity, a part of Christendom, it has a, a few very important implications. And one of them is that the whole imagination about European unity is part of main discussions in the Middle Ages and early modern time about the place of religion in society, about the relationship between state and church and so forth and so forth. I'm not going into details here, but it's an extremely important element. And one of the consequences of it is that in this discussion, orders, intellectuals refer to European unity are in a way secularists in a sense that they react against too much impact to the clerical authorities. They don't see the Pope as in any way the leader of Christendom, and that leads to what I call the secularization, yes, sometimes I use that word, of international politics. And that means, it's a very important element, uh, we can go back in the discussion, but it, it's very essential. In the historical perspective, it means that Christian monarchs in the early modern period, already in the late Middle Ages, can conclude alliances, peace treaties, and so forth, whatever, notwithstanding their religious context. Catholic kings can make an alliance with Protestants, or they can fight them, and that includes <coughs> Muslim. I like to show this siege, and that will be something that you will know here, 1543, where uh, Ottoman and French troops uh, jointly uh, fought together. That is what I mean. 
with the secularization of international politics. All idea of an eternal opposition between Islam and Christianity is rubbish. Right. In fact, that's, it was quite surprised to realize that. But much more important for me is something else. For me, the main, one of the main conclusions of the book and of my research is that Christendom gave me insight in a few very, very basic characteristics of Europe until today. And perhaps the most important is that Christendom is. And Europe became exclusive. With that, I mean it's in contrast to a popular idea among certain philosophers and political scientists today, it's not an open society. It's not at all. It always built walls around itself. It did not allow others to come in. That's one element. And the second element, and the quote from Dante Alighieri is so telling, it's so wonderful. When I saw that, I said, wow, this is everything in the It has a deep, deep longing for homogeneity and the reverse fear of diversity. You cannot allow diversity. The origin is in Christendom, where Christian monarchs build their power on the condition that everyone believes the same. Not just Christianity, but just a particular strand of Christianity. That's the origin of it. But it became a fundamental feature of European civilization. And that leads to what a famous uh, medieval historian called the persecuting society. Society that regularly persecute Jews or other outside gypsies, whatever. It's a basic narrative. And in, that is not, it is rather typical for you. You have forms of violence in every civilization. But it takes different forms. I'll make more into that later. Um, this being said, that's the dominance. At the same time, it's something I don't develop in the book, to be honest, uh, but it will be the subject of my next book. Um, you have counter narratives about toleration, separation of power, of powers, popular sovereignty, eventually democracy. It's counter-narratives that are made explicit, and that's also fundamental to understand European society. If we speak about European unity, I go a little bit faster on this, I emphasize it's not a simple linear story. It's not the idea of uh, democratic federalism that develops over time. No, it is not. You have throughout European history a variety of ideas. And that is true for the old, ancient, medieval, and early modern period, but it's also true for the 19th and 20th century. In the book, I show how in the 20th century, and I give here only examples of the 20th century to illustrate a few points, uh, the European idea is developed by reactionary conservative Catholics, by fascists, Nazis. La vie nouvelle about uh, la France européenne is a poster of Vichy France. Um, this refers to Pan-Europa. That's a more open, not really democratic, but much more uh, federalist. Uh, movement, but they all, you find, they all defend an, a certain idea of Europe. They all, for various reasons, promote the idea of a European Union. And what is more, they interact. The idea that they are very clear division lines is an illusion. It's not true. Recent research shows very clearly how even extreme right conservative, even fascist ideas, had a clear impact on the early European integration. We think about European unity, 
But of course, the plans were not always about the whole continent as we imagine it today. We will have a lot of plans who encompass just a part of it, of a number of countries. But here again, even if that is recognized in the traditional narratives, it's a very simple line. If there are a small regional association imagined as a predecessor of the EU, it's the Benelux. Well, why the Benelux? Why not uh, Middle Europa? Promoted uh, by Germans in particular. The late 19th, 20th century, lots of ideas about Middle Europa, and they had a definite influence on the way. Uh, post war European Union it has been imagined as well. You had so many pan Slavic uh, ideas. I give here uh, the ideas of uh, in the interwar period, the Polish uh, intermarium model. You see how extensive the model was imagined, but it is not what we imagine as the European Union today. Far from it. We think about the European unity as a peace project. And to be honest, it mostly was. It was. But it's complicated. The very first plans, I always like to show this, the very first plans actually were not peaceful at all. They were plans for a crusade. A crusade is not exactly a peace project. But that's the exception. And even then, if you go to look more in detail, it's not about the crusade, it's about something else. But you have very varieties of ways to imagine peace. One of the major ones is this one. Does anybody know what it is? What it represents? Nobody? The Vienna Congress, yeah. indeed. Yeah. The Congress of Vienna, 1850. European Council. Yes. Yeah. So that is one so of the... A, a professor suggested that this should be in Kursa in New European Council. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, many different plans from very different perspectives and often with hidden agendas. And throughout the, the, the book I, I, I clearly show how some plans that present themselves as peace plans actually are also about power relations. It's also about economics. Now, it's a very profound idea that economics is conducive to peace. And I also uh, lay out in the book a little bit what are the, uh, where that idea comes from. It's actually already quite old, because in the early modern times it was already advanced as an idea. Very soon there were clever philosophers who reacted against it. Again, very different kind of plans, like this one. The idea, of, and not just an idea, but also the first real common market created in Europe. Early 1860s, at the initiatives of the British, who thought that by bilaterally creating kind of free trade zone, a common market, that will be conducive to peace. Wonderful! It didn't work at all. It didn't work at all, and I will say a few things, why not later? Monetary, and also a bit later, creating an economic uh, union of Europe on the basis of cartelization like the steel cartel as the model for a future European Union. An idea that certainly reappeared in part uh, after the Second World War with the European Coal and Steel Community, which was not a cartel, but took a number of ideas of, of, uh, of Emil Meyerisch uh, and others, for example. A major uh, element in the discussion about European unity has been the relationship with the United States. Here too, um, the story is complex. 
you have here a wonderful figure of Victor Hugo, who pleads in, uh, I think it's 1848, or it could be later, I forgot, um, uh, for a uh, European uh, Union to the image of the United States. That idea has been promoted by Hugo and a few other people, um, mainly from the 1848 on, onwards. Um, there are several things you can mention about it. Their idea about what is the United States is a little bit questionable. Uh, but the main thing is, and why I love that so much, is that it's outspoken nationalists. We all think that nationalism and European unity is our two opposite ideas. Well, from a historical perspective, it's absolute nonsense. The one of, some of the most outspoken promoters of the idea of European unity, of a United States of Europe, conceived as one of the most advanced ideas about European unity were exactly the nationalists of the mid-19th century. But very often, the United States were also seen, seen as the main competitor. A competitor who should follow, try to imitate, or oppose. Actually, the idea that the United States is the enemy is very prominent at the end of the 18th century and again at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. This wonderful quote and that you have read in the meantime, I guess, uh, illustrates that the very nice Walter Rathenau, very interesting figure, uh, really, really the idea of a strong European Union to be able to withstand the competition of uh, the United States. And I still didn't say anything about the role of the United States after the Second World War. A major motivation to strive towards European unity is something that is often, almost always, forgotten or overlooked, is striving towards global dominance. And this, the paradox, and the big surprise also for me, is that it's already the case from the very end of the 19th century. When European colonization is at its peak, or not even, even just before, already then, there is the fear that once the Asian empires will rise again, China, India, called differently, but that's it. Japan, become more real, but the imagination is always about China and, uh, and India. And that is really a very strong motive to plead for European unity. Very important. I give here uh, especially the quote from a Belgian uh, Catholic historian, Godfroy Koch, is illustrative. But you find dozens and dozens and dozens of that kind of, of uh, quotes. There is a particular dimension in this global perspective that is Euro-Africa. Euro-Africa, the idea that Africa and Europe should be uh, united. And the perspective is very clearly uh, illustrated by uh, this nice uh, cartoon and the quote from Jules Destre, again a Belgian, but that's more by accident. The main important this is an outspoken leftist thinker who pleads here for this Af union with Africa from the idea of to exploit, also to civilize, but I always think you have to put that civilization between quotation marks, uh, certainly in the Belgian case, I must say. But the idea is not new. The idea is advanced in the 1860s, 1867, by Victor Hugo, who is not new. 
and it doesn't end. I will return to that in a minute. It doesn't end with the Second World War because it becomes a major element, a key element of the Treaty of Rome, 1957. I say a few words more about uh, the Second World War. Now we all think that the Second World War uh, created an awareness among Europeans that they had to unite, that they had to put an end to the endless warfare. Forget it. Forget it. If you look at the ways Europeans, by the way also Americans, and also Russians, obviously, imagined a solution for the Second World War. It was, as I call it, Versailles with a vengeance. The idea was very clearly to destroy and break up, in particular, Germany. Why that doesn't happen, why that didn't happen, that's another story. The story here is that of the Cold War. But before that, I want to say something else. What happens after the Second World War? There is one thing that really ends. That is what I call the end of the nation state, of the nation empire. Again, we all think about the 19th and the 20th century as the era when the nation state was the ideal type. That is also what I thought. But when I was looking, researching for the book and thinking, I said, I didn't find, first of all, I didn't find nation states. And secondly, I didn't find any, well, I found that almost all the major powers in the 19th and into war, century and interwar period didn't behave as the model of the nation state predicted. They didn't strove towards a nation state. They strove towards something else, to becoming an empire, an overseas empire, certainly, but also within Europe. What is Nazi Germany other than an empire within Europe? It's not, and it was certainly not the only one who dreamt about being bigger. But it's not just empire. It is an empire under the leadership of a dominant nation in which, which strives towards unification, centralization. That's why I call it the nation empire. It was very funny. I uh, wrote that in my book and then I was another, at another presentation uh, in, of the book um, I forgot where it was, in Valencia, I think, with, with a colleague, Stefan Berger, and he just had the same <laughs> conclusion as me. Well, very funny. Uh, but I think that's important. That idea of nation empire apparently disappears, and it is the idea of the nation state that will become dominant after the Second World War, in Europe and also worldwide. I realized there's still some caveats. How do we fit the Soviet Union here? I leave that question for you. Uh, for me, it's, I would say it's perhaps also imagined as a national empire, but at least also as an empire. The Cold War, absolutely decisive for me. The first that we have to realize, though, is that the Cold War creates two new Two Europes. Two unified Europes. Somehow I missed that in any history of European integration. Because suddenly it goes only about the West. But this part has also been unified. Yeah. Be it very strongly under the leadership, I would, pay, I would say, between quotation marks, of the Soviet Union. The West, Western Europe, 
also unite under the leadership of the United States, though the relations are different. I would not say, as some colleagues, that is actually not a, 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 a two empires. It's not that simple. I would not agree with that view. But nevertheless, it is the intervention of the United States that makes it possible that Western Europe, or the core of Western Europe, because what you need is the everything, um, unites in different institutions. Because again, we always think only of uh, European coal and steel community, and then you go to the EU, which, just, which really is a simplified vision. It's not really overly simplified. Okay. And as I said, the Africa, the Euro-African dimension, remains very important. The, I believe decolonization has been a very important element for European integration after the Second World War, but not as what you usually see, because uh, European integration, European communities offered an alternative for decolonization, for the continuation of the colonial empires. That's the narrative that you find now and then in the literature, and that is promoted, understandably, by the EU, but it's wrong. In first instance, you further European unity was seen, in particular by France, actually also by the United Kingdom, but in a different way, but mainly by France, followed by Belgium, as a way to continue, and originally also by the Netherlands, but they couldn't hold it, uh, as a way to continue their colonial positions. Very important element, I believe. But strangely enough, and that I'm not going to talk about today, that dimension is quickly forgotten. And I, well, it's just, subject of a different talk, and I can discuss quite at length why and how it happened, um, but um, it ended, of course, with the decolonization of Algeria and, and the Congo. But finally, there was no... And that, that also meant that yeah, the colonial perspective of the European communities uh, disappeared. Okay, now a few things that happened in the uh, following years. Decolonization, the end of the Cold War, both led to a search of identity. I say, we'll say a few things about the search of identity because I think it's important. And I have a few questions actually for you. I look forward to your reactions here. Something very strange. That is Europe, and in particular the EU. They are not the same, uh, but the EU certainly developed the idea of a negative founding myth. The idea that European unity is the product, the product of a reaction against nationalism. Strange idea for other reasons, but anyway. The two world wars, particularly the Second World War. And what emerges in the course mainly of the 1960s, but becomes really prominent only in the 1990s, is the Holocaust. In the European Union is actually the institution that will not make war possible in Europe, but also will not allow a second Holocaust. Not within Europe, but also not outside Europe. And that's a very key element. It's interesting in many respects, 
it bases the whole union in diversity ideas, the idea of European values and so forth and so forth, all based on, 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 on this founding myth. Obviously, it completely ignores the colonial language, completely forgotten. This is totally out of this narrative. Uh, in, in a number of ways, this was promoted also after the, f and actually, if you look at the details and the chronology, very strongly in the 1990s. So after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain. But there were problems. One of the problems is what uh, uh, Klaus Legerby calls the memory wars within the world. Because the Holocaust and this whole narrative is typical Western European. But certainly the Holocaust, if you speak about the Holocaust, is central for European identity. If you go to tell this in Spain, French people don't see the relevance, don't see the connection very well. But clearly, in uh, parts of your Eastern Europe, it's the same. It's clearly the same. And then we see alternative narratives, alternative memories coming up. The idea that, well, in some parts of, of, of Europe, emphasize, well, uh, European Union, unity, the new Europe should not just refer to the Holocaust and the Second World War, but should also refer to the communist past and the atrocities that were, uh, happened during the communist time. Something that uh, is very strongly felt and advanced in the Baltic countries, in Ukraine, in Poland as well. Now, there's a lot of things more to say about these memories, wars, and the different differences. But somehow I think it's important. And somehow I think it is also relevant, but I don't really know to which extent. I'm very hesitant here to explain a number of discussions within Europe today, and in which uh, this wonderful country plays a major role. But I will return to this. Uh, uh, indeed, these are then the values that are based as a kind of comprehensive framework as developed by the EU very strongly in the 1990s, early 21st century. This is also taken on in a global perspective. The EU has presented itself very strongly as promoting these universalist ideas, European, these values that we just showed, democracy, citizen rights, human rights, uh, the rule of law, even solidarity, security, freedom, of different freedoms, um, promoted equal rights and so forth in the, on a global scale. Very important. And still, if you look at the documents of the EU external action, focusing on this very, very strongly. While at the same time, uh, the real political influence of the EU, in my view, is near minimum. Minimum, but anyway. A number of concluding reflections. I still have five minutes, I believe, more or less. Um, European integration is presented as a break with the past, the EU at least. I put here Western between uh, brackets because it's really a narrative that is based on Western Europe. My question to you certainly is to which extent and how do you see it integrates uh, East European experiences is something that I do not know enough of. But I will focus in the last uh, 
Now, the question is open. Does European integration create a great middle path? It's a question mark. I leave it open. Up to you to answer. I have some answers. But I will focus on two elements. One, I emphasized in the beginning the Christian dimension. I will return to this. And second, Europe as a peace project. Other dimensions I will not uh, reflect on, but perhaps in the discussion. First of all, if we speak about the Christian legacy, a first observation, like what I already said, the very beginning ideas of Europe and or European Union were grounded in Christendom. You have well, Christendom doesn't exist anymore, so you have had a dissociation. But what is the effect of that dissociation? The effect of that dissociation in the first instance is that the concept of Europe became territorial and cultural. But that has an effect if you turn, move the idea of Europe to a basically territorial concept, then you have much broader and you you include the different histories of Europe, it's a much more complex history. Because then, obviously, the history of El Andalus, the history of the Ottoman Empire, becomes integral part of Europe. You see why I emphasize this? For me, it's obvious. But clearly, if you look at discourses that you hear here in Hungary, but also in, in, in Belgium, in Flanders, it's not so self-evident. That's one main uh, observation. The second, Christendom doesn't exist as a result of a very complex history of what I call secularizations in very different ways. That's the, the consequence of that is that the place of religion in society has changed tremendously. The story is not one of a simple uh, secularization from Christian Middle Ages to uh, a secular present. That's the story you hear, particularly in Belgium, I must say. It's it's nonsense. It's nonsense. I spoke about the secularization of international politics in the early modern time, but it was at the same time you had the confessionalization of early modern societies, meaning that the impact of religion on the life of people increased, not decreased, increased in the early modern time. In the 19th and 20th century, so-called highlights of secularization, nonsense. Yes, the state became secularized, but in many parts of Europe, religion became an extremely and sometimes even more important element in collective identities and also in political identities. So it's not a linear story. But you could say that today, especially in Western Europe, I think also in the rest of Europe, uh, secularism is very strong. But nevertheless, the way relationships are, or the, the different relations between states and religious communities, Christian churches, other religions, are designed, they are extremely divergent. There is not one European way. Not at all. There are many ways. There was a certain diverge, convergence in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. I'm not sure today. What church state separation doesn't exist in any, certainly not in any Western European. What we do see is today, 
as a result of uh, yeah well uh, as the result of um, in part to a very small part Islamic immigration a larger part because of Islamist terrorism uh, you have a double reaction. You have a reaction in part by, by you, have, you have a reaction against uh, the role of Islam in part by Christian or social Christian leaders referring back to the old Christian legacy but also by um, ex what I would say secularist forces. And you see that particularly in the Netherlands, also in Belgium, um, where people who emphasize secular values, women's emancipation, gay and lesbian rights, as core of Western civilization. And you see an interesting alliance between those groups who are claiming to defend the traditional Christian values. I think you are familiar with this discourse. And those who emphasize liberal or yeah, liberalist uh, values of which gay rights, women's emancipation also are key elements. I illustrate that uh, with these this cartoon, clearly enough, is also, but this man, I don't know if anybody knows who this man is. He's a Dutchman. He's dead already for a few years. It's Pim Fortuyn. Um, Pim Fortuyn is the founder of one of the first clearly anti-Islamic parties in the Netherlands. But he referred particularly to the defense of European liberal values. He's an outspoken gay person, and really saying what, the, what, is, what Islam is threatening is our European way of life. The European way of life is that liberal values. I ask a question. Have um, the Europe, yeah, Europe's curse, have the old demons returned? Remember, I said from the very beginning that the fear of diversity is one of the main features of Europe. The European Union has, to some extent, tried to break with that tradition. Unity, diversity. Are the, those the demons returning. If you look at what happened here, oh, yeah. <laughs> so very quick because it's the last slide in here. I think it's the last. Yeah. Uh, you see here, I think that is Hungarian, uh, you see not only the return of, of anti-Islamism, which is not the return, actually, in many ways, it's rather new, but the return of anti-Semitism, no doubt. Uh, well, the example, uh, today, if you look at the newspapers and whatever, uh, is particularly Hungary, I'm sorry, and Poland that are referred to, but it's not only. The first time I uh, recognized the re-emergence of anti-Semitism was when uh, a friend of the mother of a friend of mine in France was harassed, and that friend is Jewish, and her mother was a Holocaust survivor. But she was harassed, not in Budapest, but in Marseille. 
not by Muslims, but by uh, extreme right uh, uh, followers of the Front National. So, historians usually, I know, I still try, try to. Historians are usually uh, pessimistic. Uh, I must say that I am not optimistic to say the least. The last part. I said that I would say something more about peace. A few words. Is peace in Europe threatened? I love this quotation. You know I love quotations. Every historian likes quotations. Does anybody know who Leopold von Ranke is? Yes. He is known as being the founder of professional history. Of professional history writing. In 1854, he said, well, actually what he said is, war is no longer possible. We have the concert. Peace is guaranteed. The moment you already had the beginning of the Crimean War, you had lots of lots of wars in the second half of the 19th century. Even in 1861. Even in 1861, obviously. Well, exactly. This one the best is when he is trying to take over half of Europe. Exactly. So I always use that to say, well, that's the founder of the historical profession. <laughs> he can be so wrong. <laughs> So we have to be very modest. How scientific and social science are. But there are a, a, a few conclusions you can draw from this. I can <coughs> conclude. One is economic, also technological, <coughs> ecological entwinement is not a guarantee for peace at all. It's a very powerful myth, but there is no evidence of it from the country. Rather the contrary, I would say. What is most important to institutional and diplomatic interaction? And in that sense, I think the EU and its predecessors played a, indeed a very, very important role in pacifying Western Europe. Can we extend it? I'm not sure, perhaps. But the continuous interaction, the diplomatic interaction, and strategies of uh, pacification, because not only that, I think there is ample evidence that that made a big difference. Stable, undisputed borders. That's certainly true for the post-war period. But I think you can conclude this from the previous years as well. Uh, I think, for example, at the interwar period, the Peace of Locarno, for example, is a very good example. The Peace of Locarno uh, did stabilize international relations in Western Europe because there was clear demarcation, conclusion about the borders, but not in the East. Reconciliation sentiments, extremely important. You could say a lot of things, but if you go in to look at the different conflicts, you see how, how, how important that is, but very closely related to the element of diplomatic interaction. Beware of bad intentions. Something I never read in the, <laughs> in the textbooks. But throughout history, you see so many times political leaders who don't play the game, who don't play for in the rules of international relations and whatever. So you do have to take in account, you do need institutions, armies also, I think, to uh, take in account that not everybody has good intentions. I can assure you though that I had good intentions. <laughs> <laughs> but I and we began a quote, a last quote, just to reflect upon. 
by a Russian diplomat, 1803. And he was a diplomat, I think he was stationed in Slovenia and a few other places. So this, what is important is that he's in Russia. And you see how in the late 18th, early 19th century, people really believed in some kind of European common house. Uh, and everything, law, custom, science, trade, unite its inhabitants. And actually this trace something that I, I forgot to tell actually, but I, was, I found one of the most interesting characteristics of Europe is not so much, I said, I spoke about the theory of diversity, but Europe is actually very homogeneous. If you compare uh, Europe with Southeast Asia, India, the multitude of peoples, of languages, of religion, huge, much more, much more diverse. Europe is obsessed with that's very good. But, okay, Europeans have common ancestors, almost all are mixed. Quite interesting what he mentions is typically European. And they would be ashamed if they would consider themselves as enemies. That I certainly subscribe to. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was